Hey, you guys, it's Jim. You guys recognize this amazing smiling face. So that is our artistic director, Jim Cordy. He is also uh, the director behind the brilliant Tommy. So, Cordy, first and foremost, congratulations, man. That was Thank it's you. absolutely amazing. Thank you. Critics are loving it. The audience response, and you and I have talked a little bit about this before, has been something like I've never seen before, especially when they're, they're on their feet long before the damn show is over and people are fired up, ready to go, man. Well, it's not a formula show. It's not an old school, old fashioned musical at all, and which gave us a lot of uh, uh, creative freedom, I think, to, uh, to create something in our own aesthetic uh, with our team of designers. It's, uh, it's a huge credit to the work of so many people, this production. I couldn't be more proud of everyone. Well, you know, uh, we always tried to bring our audience along for the ride. And so we all talked and thought it would be really cool to reach out to our, our Facebook audience yeah. and ask them for questions. So we got some really great questions from the audience. So I thought maybe we can start from that as our platform. All right. And then that we'll go from there. So uh, the first question. This is question, totally unrehearsed, everybody. It is. It is the first time. And as everybody knows, like, we never edit anything. What we do is what happens. So here we go. The actor who played the oldest Tommy was incredible. His acting, singing, and everything about him was fantastic was there something he did during auditions that made you know that he was the right person for the job or was it about or what was it about him that made you select him and that is from Keith and Algonquin Keith thanks so much for your question hi Keith yeah Devin DeSantis um, a remarkable a remarkable young man uh, I think it was how he nailed the vocals that he has the chops for this and that they are effortless and that it was so impressive and such a surprise. I don't think people knew Devin DeSantis could sing like this, which is something I love about it, that I'm able to showcase someone's ability in a way it's never been seen before. Um, Can I ask, is there, were there a couple specific things that he sang in the audition? He sang from the show. He sang from the show. And it wasn't just the singing technically. It was the emotion he brought to it, the characterization he brought to it. He sang it as if he wrote it, Yeah. you know? Uh, I gotta tell you, when he sings See Me, Feel Me, I mean, it's just beautiful, oh. heart-wrenching. Oh, yeah, it's so moving, yeah. And even when he's not talking, but he's looming in the background, he's just a presence there that you just feel oh. from away. Well, yeah. you know, he he understood this whole kind of, uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, a, a child in dark, dark trouble, and uh, what helps the, the child cope is the summoning of its... They, it's referred to its future self or its higher self. or um, But I really got on the idea of it being a very spiritual idea. And, and Devin loved that. And you can tell. You can tell that he, he uh, creates this presence for the child that is his guide, his, his comfort, uh, his angel. Um, and then it's so cool how the story takes off and the little boy actually, Devin actually becomes a grown-up version of the little boy, which is a remarkable piece of writing, and it's right there on the page. Um, and I, I think we, we really wanted to uh, emphasize that progression and, and that story. Um, and we had a great time with that, yeah. You know, you and I actually talked a little bit about this before, and it goes back to what you just said about the spirituality of it. And the fact of, like, our audience is talking about it. We haven't really seen it from the critics, but also there's so much, you know, like, even the, the white that they wear and the feeling of this whole thing very much just feels like a true spiritual journey when it's all said. Yeah. Well, I think that's what Pete Townsend set out to do, just as The Who were peaking in their popularity and on the charts, and you'd think it'd be all about, you know, the fast life and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Pete Townsend decided to go east and find a guru and begin the spiritual path. And then he came back to his group and uh, 
and wrote Tommy uh, 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 as a consequence of that and as a way to try to express that. And uh, I, I thought that was a really strong uh, thing for me to run with. Uh, and, uh, and, I, I, and I think we got a certain amount of success with that. You know, um, what's interesting is there was a uh, article that is on Chris Jones's blog that came out today. It will be in print tomorrow on the Chicago Tribune and literally singing your praises for what you found in Tommy that a lot of people he feels has lost. And that is exactly what you talk about. Like Townsend doesn't talk about that. You know, he goes on about the fact of some of these greatest rock stars we've ever had, like Jagger and Townsend, those guys were born in World War II, post-World you know, War II, and the influence that has on their lives and the things they've seen as kids, et cetera. And he, he just gives you all sorts of credit for finding something that a lot of people miss when doing Tommy and the impact that, you know, the, that has on families and the children and couples and trying to reclaim their lives after all that. Well, we talked about how important it was to depict these characters uh, and how they resonate historically. Um, and, and uh, you know, a, a father at war, a, a, a pregnant wife at home, um, and, uh, you know, her learning that her husband uh, won't come home, uh, and how we had to represent uh, war widows, uh, and that she had to find a way to do it personally. And that the soldiers who came to to tell her this, how they had to represent how they've lost their brothers in war, and what a heartbreaking situation it is for them to have to bring this news to a young wife and mother. Um, they all rose to that and embodied that, and and I think that's what's making a difference. You know, uh, while we're still talking about the actors. There was a really great question that we got uh, from a woman named Susan in Oak Park. And she said, how would you describe the role you play as the director when working with, an, with these actors? Is it mentor? Is it teacher? Is it motivator? Is it collaborator? Is it some kind of combination? <laughs> Susan, it's all of that. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above, Susan. You know, you, uh, you, you choose the actors you're going to work with because I suppose you see something of yourself in them. And you see something of the what the writer is writing about in them. And then you, you plan your rehearsals as much as you possibly can, but then when you're in that rehearsal room and you're in the moment and you start drawing things out of them and they start bringing things that you run with and, uh, um, and we just kind of mold and sculpt uh, these these characters and these relationships, and uh, and and do what we can together to uh, uh, make the storytelling clearer and and more deeply felt. And uh, it, but it it's all of that. It's all of that. And collaboration is is the big thing. It, it's it's not a one man show. You know, the director gets a lot of credit. And even as an artistic director, I get a lot of credit for a lot of people's work. Um, collaboration is, is really, I think, the secret of, of doing great work because you go beyond your own expectation because you're letting other people contribute to it and it becomes more than what you ever thought it could possibly be because everyone's involved and everyone's coming from a very dedicated place, a very uh, purposeful place in, uh, in telling the story. We have a, a guy, his name is uh, John T. from Chicago, and he follows us all the time. Really great guy. And he had a really good question about the rehearsal process and said, I had read that the rehearsal period for Tommy and all of the shows and the Broadway series, for that matter, is three to four weeks with so many elements of the show to focus on, singing, acting, technical aspects, including some sound and music and choreography and stage violence, etc., How were you able to put all of this together and come up with such an amazing final result in such a short time period? Is there a certain order or system to how you approach such a daunting hmm. task? John. Well, John, I don't know how we <laughs> do it. Uh, 
show after show. Um, we did a run through after 10 days in the rehearsal hall. Choreography, music, staging, everything. I don't know how we did it. Uh, we, we form a schedule and I have a great assistant, Trent Stork, and we, uh, we create a schedule and we try to stay on that schedule and we just start knocking it out. But again, it's those moments in the rehearsal space uh, when people are just bringing everything they've got to it and it seems to start going by so quickly and, and like, hey, we're getting somewhere. Um, but I, I can tell you, you can be as organized as you want. You can create all kinds of systems, but there really isn't a formula. There's a, it's a tremendous amount of luck mixed mm. with talent and skill. That's all I can tell you. Um, we have a question from uh, Scott in Palatine who said, what about this story moved you personally that made you want to tell it and direct it? <sighs> Big question. Well, you know, we all have uh, dark times in our life and you don't know how you come out of it. Uh, you repress it. You try to forget it. And you could be very successful at that. And then in your adult life, these things start to pop up. And uh, I saw something in Little Tommy's trauma that spoke to me uh, that I wanted to take responsibility for. And, uh, and I think that was the most moving part of it for me, that he had parents that loved him desperately and yet made tremendous mistakes. He had relatives that made tremendous mistakes and yet at the end of the story he can hold them in his arms and look into their eyes and forgive them and what that does for him, how emancipated he is and how he can become this figure that people want to follow because of his grace. I think that's what I try to create, and I think that's probably pretty close to what we were able to do in such a short amount of time. And, I, and I've got to tell you, you know, there's obviously, you know, it's Tommy, and so yes, you know, the, the kid is picked on, and, you know, and he gets abused by other kids and his own cousin and goes through a really rough time. And you would think when you leave a show like that, you're going to walk out and you are going to want to go see your psychologist and grab a bottle of Jameson. And it isn't the case at all because it's, you know, the second act is at the end such a, you know, halfway through such a celebration of life and forgiveness and, you know, really talking about the fact of learning from others and especially, you know, in the final song on stuff, you walk out and that audience is jacked up and feeling good, which is the most interesting thing because when you think about Tommy, you don't think like, man, I'm going to walk out as a feel good, <laughs> kind of like Miss Saigon. You well, leave. Everybody you... loves the music. They know they're going to hear, right. you know, this, this great music that they love, they loved for decades um but i uh but i think it's a combination of that and then that release and well, you know everybody finds before. it somehow when people start to understand the story that these songs are telling they uh they've said to me i thought i was going to be depressed and it was i just felt so exhilarated at the end and and that's because i think we never let them off the hook I think that we keep them connected. Uh, we keep a certain amount of tension all the time and that they're, they're involved, they're following it. Um, and I think that's a really difficult to do. And I think we were only able to do it because of everybody's effort and everybody's work and everybody's desire to work together and make this happen. Yeah. Got a question from Jenny in Ottawa. She says, was your concept for the show most like the Broadway version, the film version, the album version, a combination, or something <laughs> that you just decided and came up with, with on your own or with your other collaborators? Well, of course, I, I saw the original movie uh, premiere in New York City at the Ziegfeld. In New York City, I, I guess I was in a show. I can't remember what show it was. Probably a chorus line or something. No, it wasn't a chorus line. Candide. Anyway. Um, and uh, I've only seen video 
of uh, what Des Makinoff did. Uh, and I did see the, the original Broadway production. Um, I forgot that. Uh, but I actually saw the original. Um, and that was like, we can't do that. And, and, I, and I know that, so what are we going to do? So I just look at the page. You know, I just look at what they wrote. And, and how are we going to get this to materialize? How do we physicalize this? How are we going to visualize this? And working with our designers uh, is how it all happens. We just start this conversation. We sit around a table. And we just go, what about this? Or how about that? And, uh, you know, after several days and hours and hours and hours of, of conferences, uh, you start to see something you're real excited about. And that's, that's what I love about having a theater practice at Paramount, is that I get the opportunity to work with people. I, I don't imagine how I ever would work with anywhere else. Um, and I get to do it <laughs> yearly, annually. Uh, you know, I get, I get to be here and direct. Um, any director would would do anything to be in the position that I am right now, and I'm grateful for it every day. We've got one more question, and it's from uh, Kevin in Wheaton that says, in a show like The Who's Tommy, you have fantastic music, great choreography, and fabulous, fabulous acting. Does one carry more weight than the other when telling a story? I think they're all actors. They're... There are actors who sing, there are actors who dance. I think I talk to my singers and my dancers as if they're actors. Uh, and I think that's something I learned from Bob Fosse, um, Michael Bennett. Um, and uh, I'm so happy to pass it on, you know. Uh, and I think that's, that's why they rally around it, that they they realize how important it is for them to have their own thoughts and their own stuff to bring, uh, how useful it is. And that's the way to be truly creative uh, is, is knowing that their energy is so important and it's unique and it's what's gonna make this feel fresh and original and new. And you can do that, I don't care how old the show is. And you don't have to tear it upside down and inside out and revise it and deconstruct it. Just do what's on the page, but have a bunch of people around you who are ready to just, you know, dig in and and uh, put themselves into it. Now, I will say this, that I had one of the most fascinating experiences in my life on opening night because I actually got to watch the show. Normally, marketing doesn't. We got a lot of stuff going on. But since my leg's broken, uh, the <laughs> boss said, why don't you sit and watch the show? I was fortunate enough to sit next to you, and next to you was Trent, the assistant director. And what I found fascinating is, you know, we all see here the passion that you have, you know, when we're doing any show, whether you're the artistic director on the show, whether you're directing the show. But it was fascinating to me sitting next to you during a show because you're an enormous fan on top of that during an actual show that, you know, you're cheering and you're crying and <laughs> literally like almost like you, you see it for the very first time. And it was such an amazing experience to be able to be next to somebody who is that passionate about it, knowing this show better than probably anybody on that stage. And it was still so emotional and so cool for you and so energetic to be around. And I'll always remember that experience. And I've been doing this a really long time, but it was a really cool that's, opening night experience for me. It's really nice. And that's who you are. That's why one of the reasons we're so successful is that passion that you have behind all this stuff. Thank you. So uh, before we go, you need to recharge your batteries. Then we go into Lay Miz, man. It's, yeah. It's going to be huge. Yeah. This is the cast of Les Mis. Oh. It's 33 actors, uh, including our, our, our little nuggets, uh, who are amazingly skilled actors themselves. Um, we have a set by Kevin Depinay, lighting by Jesse Klug, uh, costumes by Teresa Hamm. Uh, sound by Adam Rosenthal, and these beauties uh, that I I just can't wait. Um, February eighteenth we begin, 
And Less than a month. Yeah. And we start day one all over again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's funny because it always feels like the first time. It's like, <laughs> part of me doesn't, like, what are we doing? I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Um, and what I love is, it's not like we're going from a small show to a medium-sized show. We just went from a huge, huge show, show to another huge show. To a, and Poppin' was a yeah, huge show, show. And Cats was a huge show. Yeah. Well, right now, it's it's very important to us that people know we're here for them and that we want to show them work they want to see. And we're, we're running with the biggest titles we can get the licenses for um, because we know that's what our audience wants. Uh, and yeah, it's insane, the challenges to go back to back, huge, huge productions without any kind of break in between, but um, we can do it. And we've got the talent here, we've got the people here. We have staff like you wouldn't believe. Um, and that's how it's getting done. Everyone just caring to make a difference and theater can make a difference to people. You know, it's that, that threshold they step through when they walk through the doors of the theater and they have an experience that they, when they leave, they, they talk about it and it's part of their lives and they think about it. And that's what we're here for. And that's what we're here to give you. Uh, that's why these shows were written. You know, an author is coming up with an answer to a problem and it turns into this show. And try to figure out what, what is this an answer to, this show? What's he trying to figure out by writing this? Uh, I think that's what's been showing us the way to do things the way we do here. And what's exciting everybody uh, working on it, that that's the way we're approaching it. Um, so wow. yeah, it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing stuff that's going on. Well, uh, thank you, Jim Cordy, for taking the time out of your day to do this with us. And a huge thank you to our wonderful patrons, you know, Keith and Kevin and Scott and Susan and John and Jenny Good for questions. taking the time. They're great questions, <laughs> and maybe we can do this again when we get to Les Mis, man. It was sure. a lot of fun. I'd be happy to. You know that. Come see Jim Cordy's uh, Tommy. It is amazing. You're amazing. Thank you, Cordy, for everything. Nice so long, everybody.